Uh, that was 1890 when he was recruited for that for the Chicago World's Fair. But the 372-acre Washington Park was nearly complete. Work had only begun on Jackson Park at this time. But the, as you know, the world uh, when they, he did design the White City included water. Here's some historic images. Included waterways, these wonderful canals where they had gondoliers, islands, and peninsulas. Homestead was determined to create a pleasing natural environment that would soften the effects of the imposing architecture of this white city. Structures that would be erected, and, and he really wanted to soften that architecture. Needless to say, its grounds were flooded with enthusiastic visitors, and the writers of the day waxed ecstatic about this incredible city, beautiful exposition, its buildings, grounds, gardens, and waterways. And by the way, as many of you know, because it was finally only officially announced, although most of us, some of us knew about it, uh, soon, uh, the Devil in the White City is going to become a new series on Hulu, executive produced by Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio, starring, get this, starring Keanu Reeves, not as the devil, as we all thought, but starring Keanu Reeves as Daniel Burnham. It's just been officially announced. Go figure. And I think directed by Martin Scorsese as a limited four hour, I think four hours on Hulu. You can expand the story into four hours. It gives you much more time to expand upon the characters. And as I understand it, the two principal characters that are going to be telling the story, well, in addition to the devil, we're going to be seeing it through the eyes and experiences of Daniel Burton and Frederick Law Armstead, according to something that was just posted the other day. Can't wait to see who's, who knows who's going to be cast as Frederick Law. Wait, wait and see. Wait and see. Well, after the fair concluded, by the way, Senior, Senior continued to work there, and his sons continued to work and make many improvements to these parks in Chicago. That included the Japanese Garden. Of course, it was, it, created, it was there during the WCE, but he made improvements to it still. It's still there today. The city of Chicago and its parks department has recently restored the Japanese Garden. I recommend going out to see it there in Jackson Park. The only structure that remains from the WCE, here's an overview. The only structure that remains, some of you know this, is the Museum of Science and Industry. And I think it's about here. I don't want to get bogged down into any details, but no doubt some of you know there's still some considerable controversy about the Obama Presidential Center currently under construction there in Jackson Park. <laughs> By the way, after Senior's death, the brothers were brought in to design another system of neighborhood parks all around the outer, the inner. I don't know. It's, a, it's another ring of parks, I'll put it that way, further removed from the downtown parks. And uh, I think I just have one image for you. Oh, well, here's the fountain of time. On the, some of you know this. I keep forgetting I have this here. It's just such a gorgeous sculpture on the one end of the Midway Plaisance by Loretta, Loretta Taft. Here is Washington Park, uh, still there today, also undergoing restoration. And uh, here is Sherman Park, which was added in by the brothers, along with a whole system of parks in the 20th century. So there's a, two levels of Olmsted Park uh, contributions to the city of Chia uh, Chicago. Now let's head to Riverside, just 13 or so miles from downtown Chicago. He and uh, Calvert Block started working there in 1869. And uh, this, these are just some random scenes I want to show you how beautiful it is with its bucolic lanes and curvilinear paths and the, the displaying river and all the beautiful homes that have extensive setbacks so that the whole community just seems like a rolling green park with these gorgeous homes designed by many of the famous architects of the day. Some of you might know this. Here is the famous water tower. I love this picture because it is actually kind of an urban setting next to the railroad station. But the way this photographer magically captured it, it seems like the water tower is just rising out of the forest. But there it is. That's Riverside. Now, I'm going to take you to Indianapolis to a site that maybe is not so well known. I'll put some from Europe in there. Uh, here is Old Fields, the former Lily Mansion in Indianapolis. It's now part of the New Fields uh, complex, which includes, of course, the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And it was the Olmsted brothers under Percival Gallagher who designed this place. There's the Ravine Garden, Percival Gallagher, with the Olmsted brothers. Here is the Allee. Uh, and here are some pictures of the gardens. And here is the Newfields Lily House and Gardens. It was originally called Old Fields, now it's called Newfields. Uh, but it's part of the Newfields complex. I have not been there. I did do a virtual program for them this past winter. It was supposed to be live, of course, it could be virtual. So I might get seen and I'm looking forward to seeing you feel it's one of these days. Has anyone here been to the fields? Yes, you, oh good, 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 glad to know that. Now, uh, let's go to, uh, let's go to uh, Detroit next. Here it is, there's Belle Isle Park. Belle Isle, 982 acres, the country's largest city park, and in fact larger in acreage than is Central Park. He was commissioned to transform the island into a park in Olmsted, Senior, in 1881. He wasn't very pleased with the site the city had collected. He found it mosquito 
infested and the waters were covered with scum and he was concerned about diseases that the locals that they would visit such a park would be exposed to. So it would require much thought and human labor to transform it into an intentionally designed, manicured and managed city park. A carefully crafted plan. Uh, here is uh, Homestead's original plan for Belle Isle. Uh, it included a promenade, here it is in 1910, it included canals for canoeists, which also was part of the drainage system. They're still there today, some of you have been to it. It's in a mixed bag state. It's now, of course, owned and operated by the DNR, the Mich Michigan DNR. It is a state park for the state of Michigan. The state and Belle Isle Conservancy have put a lot of money into it, but it is an ongoing effort. I've now seen it over a period of years. Parts of it are refreshed and looking better than ever. There is a brand new Pete Odolf Garden, which was just unveiled a year ago. Gorgeous, I wish I had a picture. I'm gonna to have to add a picture of that in the future. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's a giant park which is getting ongoing attention. It's certainly a wonderful amenity for the city of Detroit and its residents, that's for sure. Uh, uh, it was highly popular during its heyday uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Highly popular, swarmed by visitors. And some of you know that an aquarium was added, a conservatory, here it is, the Anna Scripps Whitman Conservatory was added after Homestead's time, and other structures were added to this park. Uh, many changes have been made to it, for better or for worse, since Homestead's time. Controversially, Homestead seems to have left it a little prematurely in the huff, when the project wasn't quite complete because the city of Detroit refused to continue payments. So there's some controversy and legend around that, and rumor, I will say. Now, finally, Ohio. Finally, Ohio. You're wondering, when are we going to get to Ohio? In fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about other places in Ohio before I even get to Cleveland. Because, you know, Olmsted and the father and sons, they did a lot of work for universities and colleges and private schools across America. And including, by the way, they had a particular attachment to working on the land-grant institutions of America, what we sometimes call our state Aggie schools. The Ohio State, see, I got it right. The Ohio State, the Ohio State University actually has a little bit of Olmsted history on the campus. Now, here is a 1911 plan for the uh, commissioned by the Olmsted brothers. It included the, what was then called the Ohio Archaeological and Historical Museum. My understanding is that, and note its proximity to the president's residence. And I don't know if that's still the case. I've never been on this campus. But I gather that building became the Ohio Historical Society. Uh, and I think it's now been renamed uh, the Ohio Con History Connection. Some of you might know this, but I don't know if the current Ohio History Connection building in Columbus is in fact this original building that's been refined and restored. Probably not, right? Correct? No. No, no right. Went to the early 70s. Thank you. I was one, I'm not been clear about that. I've never been to Columbus. I've never set foot on the Ohio State University campus. I look forward to doing that in the future. Because I knew I like to, you know, I like to ground truth. It's important for me to ground truth, and I don't like to talk about places that I've never ground truth. So I always appreciate clarifications from the audience for those in the know. Thank you. Uh, here is another story that I find fascinating. And I expect some of you know this. Between 1899 and 1932, the Olmsted brothers designed the landscaping and layout for the National Gas Register complex in Dayton. The firm prepared plans for the property's factory sites, dormitories, and officers' club. Additionally, it featured several recreational fields, including a boys' garden, uh, that's what they called it, a boys' garden, a ball playing field, and an open-air gymnasium. And here is the plan for old, the Olmsted Brothers' plan for Old River Park, which, if I'm not mistaken, I know for a fact, as it says right on the plan, it was commissioned for the NCR company. Now, I have never, I profess ignorance again, I've never been to Dayton. But unless I'm mistaken, Old River Park still does exist, and it's incorporated into the campus of the University of Dayton. Right? And here's a couple of images of Old River Park in the, uh, I believe in the early 20th century, or late 19th, early 20th century, Old River Park in Dayton. So it's fascinating, and I also look forward to visiting there to do some further ground truth in the future. Finally, Cleveland, I'm surrounded by local experts. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, so if you bear with me for a few minutes, I'm going to quote a portion a description of the fine arts garden to be found on the website of the Cultural Landscape Foundation. This garden, isn't that a nice picture? This garden occupies land that was originally part of a 73 acre parcel donated in 1882 to the city of Cleveland uh, for use as a park by industrialist Jeff the Wade, who I know you all know here. A small adjoining segment was initially held as a reserve was donated by Wade's own grandson to the city for the creation uh, of a garden for the Cleveland Museum of Art, which opened 
the Art Museum itself opened in 1916. In 1925, the Garden Club of Cleveland hired Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. to beautify the institution's surrounding parkland. The firm's designs, here's the lower end garden uh, scheme of 1926. Here is the Euclid Overlook conceptual drawing, for also from that same year. It was completed by the firm's Edward Whiting and Leon Zach in 1928. It included a formal garden that fronted the museum. Here's a construction image, by the way, under construction. As I understand it, the Fine Arts Garden was presented to the city of Cleveland by the Garden Club at a dedication ceremony in 1928. Uh, and here is the Fountain of Waters uh, sculpture, of course, by Chester A. Beach. You all know this. The garden, as you also know, has undergone a series of rehabilitations in recent years, including in 2000 by the landscape architecture firm Benke and Associates, and by the more, to me, the more well-known firm of the Sasaki firm did a much more recent restoration work on the garden in 2018, according to the Cultural Landscape Foundation. By the way, uh, I came across this quote, which is actually on the, the uh, Art Museum's website about the garden, and they're quoting Junior, and Junior had this to say, I know of no other example of landscape art as beautiful as this, where there is such a large part of the population passing by daily to enjoy it. And he was referring to the fine arts garden, apparently, back then. Now, uh, there's much more detail on the Art Museum website, by the way, uh, including uh, some of those historic images that I just showed you, and uh, of course the beautiful... I have another picture here to close this out. Here's another image of the Fine Arts Garden in full bloom in the spring. Now, finally, uh, and, and it's, of course, uh, I want to... Uh, it's integrated into the larger Wade Park District, as all of you know, and thanks to the care and the attention that this garden has received, through the years, it's clear to me that it is much loved by Cleveland. And I want to compliment those who worked on this project, including the Cleveland Museum of Art. Now, a uh, brief word about the Bingham Hanna Mansion, or the Hanna Garden. Uh, it's only recently that I learned, in fact, that the A. Donald Gray, a landscape architect of summer down here in Cleveland, began his career with the Olmsted brothers in Brookline, Mass. And he arrived in Cleveland in subsequently in 1920. But apparently the Hanna family had previously corresponded with the Olmsted brothers during the years 1917 to 1921. And we have that material that has been risen to the surface thanks to the librarian here. Uh, but we also have documentation of correspondence and garden plans that A. Donald Gray developed subsequently for the Hanna family during the years 1925 to 1934. I have not been able to plow into this research. I only just saw the garden, not that garden, that garden for the first time today. Uh, but I trust that local historians and concert of the library, lo local historians here at this institution, in concert with the Library of Congress and the Olmsted National Historic Site, will be able to tell more of a complete story about this unique garden, which I understand you're, you're raising some funds for its full future, near future restoration, I trust. I'm going to bring this program to a close. You're wondering when I'm going to get there. <laughs> during the past couple of years, during the past couple of years of COVID quarantine and social distancing, Public parks have been a lifesaver for so many of us seeking fresh air, exercise, physical and psychological health. Uh, Olmsted uh, emphasized this in his writings and in his park designs. Uh, not only public health, mental health, but taking it even further, the spiritual health benefits of the park experience for everyone in a democracy. Uh, Olmsted, if one reads his writings carefully, you can see that he cared deeply about all those issues. So as we commemorate Olmsted Senior's birthday and the Olmsted Landscape Design Legacy during this year and henceforward, we also highlight the ever more crucial role that the public park experience plays in our lives. Needless to say, COVID and social and environmental justice movements have only greatly underlined that very fact. And the urgent need to provide more green space to distribute it equitably and to make all such spaces accessible and inviting to all. It isn't too much of a stretch to say that that was Olmsted's agenda from the very start in the 19th century. So I do pray for all of our sakes that we'll have this pandemic soon in our rear view mirror everyone and if you haven't yet done so take a road trip across america <laughs> visit some of these cities and parks that you've never explored before revisit those that you haven't seen in a long time like niagara falls go up to Rhode island and visit some of these i hate the term rust belt cities what a terrible term uh, but i, I want to leave you with these thoughts two thoughts first we're going to let daniel burnham well, actually, here's a nice image. I'm going to just flash by it. But isn't that a lovely image? There's, a, there's the uh, U.S. Capitol in the background there behind Olmsted. Uh, we're going to put this image back up. Perhaps we'll let Daniel Burnham, the driving force for the World Columbian Exposition, close out this program. When the World's Fair was set to open in 1893 at a dinner with all the artists and architects of the day gathered to lie big 
Ego Bourbon, for his achievements and his accomplishments, Bourbon himself pivoted, unusually for him, and he deferred to his uh, collaborator, Frederick Law Olmsted, sitting demurely, and I have to tell you, already crumbled with failing health, sitting demurely at the banquet table before him. Burnham pivoted and he said this about his collaborator, quote, each of you knows the name and genius of him who stands first in the heart and confidence of American artists, the creator of your own parks. It is he who has been the best advisor and constant mentor. Frederick Law Olmsted, an artist, he paints with lakes and wooded slopes, with lawns and banks and forest covered hills with mountainsides and ocean views. He should stand where I do tonight, not for the deeds of his later years alone, but what, for what his brain hath wrought and his pen has taught for half a century. Finally, in Olmsted's own words, isn't this a lovely picture? It's from the Boston Globe. In Olmsted's own words, the beauty of the park should be in the beauty of the fields, the meadow, the prairie, the green pasture, and the still waters. What we want to gain is tranquility and rest to the mind. Is it doubtful that it does men good to come together this way, in pure air, and under the light of heaven? Frederick Law Olmsted. It seems to me that that prescription, if you will, rings as loud today in 2022 as it did in the late 19th century. Thank you, Frederick Law Olmsted and Sons. Thanks for all of you for your attention today.